When my father's grandfather was born, life expectancy ranged around 35 years. People died from infections, cancer, or metabolic syndromes. Since then, life expectancy has more than doubled and reached 82 years in the European Union now. Diseases that were once deadly don't play a big role anymore. But there is one cluster of diseases that does not show this trend. Disorders of the brain. 25 years ago, 9% of all invalidity pensions were paid due to depression or anxiety. Today, this share has increased to 43%. And what is even more alarming is that the number of teenagers who show symptoms of depression has more than doubled in the last 10 years. It is estimated that more than 1 billion people on this planet suffer from a disorder of the brain. For example, depression, anxiety, addiction, ADHD, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, psychosis, or epilepsy. Despite all progress in medicine, why don't we have effective tools to treat disorders of the brain? The reason is that despite all technological progress, we still don't have the answers to very fundamental questions. For example, how does the brain create what we perceive as reality? And what are the neural substrates of brain functions affected by depression, anxiety, or addiction? The complexity of the brain and the variability across people seems prohibitive to answer any of these questions. But there is hope. We have now entered an era in which clinical neurotechnology may help to answer some of these questions. Neurotechnology is defined as any artificial means to record, analyze, or modulate brain activity. And there's been great progress in development of tools that allow us to measure brain activity at unprecedented temporal and spatial resolution. By analyzing this activity in real time and translating it into a control signal of a digital device, man-machine interaction has now reached a new level. Using such a brain-computer interface, or BCI, it is now possible to control a robot or a drone just by thinking. The first clinically meaningful BCI was introduced in the late 90s when a patient who, s who suffered from ALS and was locked in, so he was not able to speak or move, and he depended on artificial respiration, could select single letters on a screen just by modulating his electric brain activity. With this system, he could write a whole letter. In parallel, implantable brain-computer interfaces were developed for reconstruction of complex movements. Here you see a woman who suffered a brainstem stroke and who was incapable of moving any of her four limbs in a meaningful, functional way. After implantation of a neural implant, she was able to control this robotic arm in three dimensions and for the first time grasp a cup of coffee and drink it. However, implantation entails the risk of bleedings and infections. There is no certification for long-term use of such devices, and none of these patients have used the system outside of the laboratory in their daily life. There are also other disadvantages when implanting such devices. For example, the user cannot remove the device at will. And implanting such a device in hundreds of thousands or even millions of people raises a number of very complex neuroethical questions. Together with my team, I have developed a non-invasive brain-computer interface that does not depend on any implantation. Here you see a number of patients who suffered from a spinal cord injury. They are all unable to move their fingers. They cannot grasp anything. For example, a pen, a cup, or a piece of paper. We have equipped these patients with a neural exoskeleton that translates their intention to move their paralyzed fingers into actual movements. And with this system, these patients 
can now grasp these different objects of daily living and manipulate them. The system could be also used outside of the laboratory, so the people could leave the lab and go to a restaurant, order a donut, and eat for the first time with a fork. So we asked the patients what they would like to do with their new ability. And this man, he asked for a plate of potato chips that he hasn't eaten for many years independently. Here you see how this system really has an impact <laughs> on its quality of life. We have also used the system in chronic stroke patients who were unable to move the fingers. They used the system for a whole month on a daily basis. And after one month, we were very surprised to find that some of these patients were able to move their paralyzed fingers even without the exoskeleton. When we looked into their brains using advanced neuroimaging, we found that their brains have reorganized and rewired in response to using this neural exoskeleton. Brain activity shifted to those areas that were connected to the exoskeleton. The same principle may also work in the treatment of other disorders of the brain. However, in contrast to movements, we cannot ask a patient to be depressed or anxious and then stop it like a movement. But there is a solution, or there might be a solution, using virtual reality, whole body variable sensors, and advanced non-invasive brain stimulation. Using these tools, we can now specifically manipulate the sensory input and track complex decision-making and behavior while brain activity is recorded. Using machine learning, typically used in artificial intelligence, for example, deep neural networks, we can now detect and identify the hidden patterns of brain activity that underlie the process of how we build our internal models of the world. To assess these models, um, we need to record brain activity at the highest possible temporal and spatial resolution. And while implantation can help us to characterize this, these hidden patterns, it is now possible to measure and assess these patterns non-invasively using quantum sensors. Quantum sensors are working at room temperature, they are variable, and they provide a much higher spatial resolution than established techniques like electroencephalography. Although there are still a number of technical challenges that have to be solved, it is very obvious that using quantum sensors has many advantages over implantation. Despite progress in biosignal sensors, we have also developed advanced brain stimulation techniques. These, tech these devices reach uh, unprecedented spatial resolution using electromagnetic fields. We can use these systems to target large-scale brain networks that are affected by depression or dementia. With support of the European Research Council, we have now merged all these techniques in a closed-loop real-time system, and we are working on using the system in patients with a variety of disorders of the brain. To see what is already possible now, let's listen a moment to Ms. Felski Krüger, who suffered from an incapacitating depression for more than a year and who was treated with non-invasive brain stimulation at the Charité. Ja, also ich war in einem ganz schlechten Zustand. Ich hatte ganz schwere Depressionen. Ich war sechs Wochen im Krankenhaus. Danach war ich in der Tagesklinik ein Vierteljahr und es hat nichts geholfen. Also ich konnte machen, was ich wollte. Es half nichts. Und ich habe immer nach Wegen gesucht, ob es andere Möglichkeiten gibt, vielleicht was anderes zu tun. Und da habe ich im Internet nach langen Recherchen die Möglichkeit gefunden, so eine Stimulation des Gehirns durchführen zu lassen an der Charité. Und da habe ich gedacht, egal. Ich rufe da an und ich mache das. Ich habe nichts zu verlieren. Es kann nur besser werden. Naja, was heißt verändert? Ich bin so viel früher. Also und das, das war schon nach der ersten Woche. Habe ich dann gedacht, 
irgendwas ist anders. Ich bin in die Küche gegangen, ich fing an Kuchen zu backen und Armbrot zu machen. Und da dachte ich auch, sollte die Behandlung schon irgendwie angeschlagen haben. Ja, und das wurde immer besser, immer besser. Und die 14 Tage wurde das meiner Meinung nach alles nur gefestigt. Also ich fühle mich jetzt so, als wäre ich nie krank gewesen. Mein Mann sagt, endlich habe ich meine alte Katja wieder. <lacht> ja, und ich rufe meine Freunde wieder an. Ich mache Termine. Ich rede ohne Unterlass, sage ich jetzt mal. Früher habe ich überhaupt nicht gesprochen. Ich unternehme was. Ich, ich mache Gartenarbeit im Haushalt. Ich habe ganz viel Lust, was zu unternehmen. Und ich, ich lebe wieder. Ich habe ein Jahr nicht gelebt. Ich lebe wieder. Und das ist die große Veränderung. I am convinced that the next chapter in clinical neurotechnology will be a turning point in how we treat disorders of the brain, provided we implement a firm neuroethical framework, keeping an eye on critical issues such as privacy, data security, and accessibility. Neurotechnology may become the biggest game changer in recent human history. Thank you. Thank you.